but she's got to get her worked up enough to where she'll babble some, some to where she has this ecstatic expression, okay? And, and the other one, of course, was the young girl that she's supposed to be a God-called minister, and she's saying the same thing over and over again, ha ba 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 ha da ba 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 and uh, give him a house, and, and give this guy a car, and, and the laughter in that is not somebody making fun of, that's what the uh, Pentecostals uh, are calling, uh, uh, it's a spiritual laughter, it's an overflowing, an overwhelming of the Holy Spirit, you just lose it, you lose it and you laugh. Uh, there was a big revival down in Florida area back years ago, you can look it up, where the whole meeting for weeks was nothing but laughter. Weeks of laughter, they get together and they just lose it for a solid week or the, of just laughing and laughing. And it was called the, the, the laughing revival or some sort like that. But you can look that up. You can look at these things. Now, uh, why is, th is this a problem? Is this a problem? It is an extreme problem because it flies in the face of Scripture itself and especially what we're going to deal with today. And that's why I wanted to kind of share that. I encourage you to look at these things. I've gone, I've seen it personally firsthand. It's not something I have not been around. It's something I've been around purposely, exposed myself to it, to see if there is anyone that's following it, even scripturally, as what we're going to see that Paul lays out some things. Uh, but that will also be next Wednesday. But uh, the reality is, is that there are some to try, but I've not seen it. I've not seen it. Just not seeing it. And, and you, I can maybe find one video clip of where a group is trying in some form or fashion to fall, but they still fly in the face of Scripture uh, as it goes on. And so, the very, very interesting. It's very interesting. Uh, I'm not saying they're not sincere. I think those people are very sincere. I just think that they are wrong when it comes to the interpretation of Scripture. Yeah. Okay? Uh, I think they're wrong when it comes to the interpretation of Scripture. Uh, what, what is horrifying about that one the last one that we saw was that literally this girl makes a profession of faith yet somehow she still has demon possession and even after supposedly baptism spirit really hadn't come and dwell her and so you've got to uh, you know feel something ecstatic and then be able to mumble before uh, you're proclaimed by the other person to have received the Holy Spirit and, and that is nowhere in scripture uh, is there any kind of representation of this at all? So anyway, I want to, us to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 again. Starting in verse 13. I'm going to read verse 12 as we go to verse 13. Walk through about 23, uh, go to 23, just verse by verse looking at scriptures and see how that this flies in the face of scripture. What, why has it upset me? Tell me what upsets me. It upsets me because uh, there are children that are going off to camps and revivals, and I've I was around it when I was younger. Not ex as in I had friends that were Pentecostal Assembly of God things. They were my friends in high school and friends, uh, and they would go off and, and they would get worked up into a fervor, come back and claim things, and but could not could not accomplish these things. This is it was always interesting to me, and uh, we would talk about it. And so I don't want to, I was not hidden from these things as a young man, and I don't want my children hidden from these things as, as their young men, because they need to be able to talk about it in a fashion that is scriptural and sound, to be able to discuss these things and shed light on scripture. Shed light on scripture. Now, here's what uh, another thing is, is uh, what, what do they teach and preach? Uh, I, don't, I don't ever suggest to my children, I would not suggest to any children, is let's, let's just have a conversation on tongues. I'd rather have a conversation on security of the believer, and then we'll get to tongues. Okay? Or when does one get filled with the Holy Spirit? Because the Bible is very specific, and that's a very easy topic to discuss, because uh, does it happen at baptism? Is one, is one saved at baptism? Not a chance. Not a chance. And that's very easy to prove. Is, is salvation a secure thing or is it something for this person right here? If she doesn't feel the right emotion, she's going to think she's lost all over again. That's upsetting. That's upsetting. Or this little child who thinks she's speaking in some kind of angelic language and she's just speaking gibberish doesn't make any sense to anybody. That's upsetting to me uh, to deceive a child like that. I, I, I don't like that at all. I, I think it's ridiculous and I think it's uh, insincere. Uh, and I think it's uh, heresy. Amen. 
heresy. So uh, that's my personal thoughts on that. And now why do I think these things? Look at, start at verse 12, go to 13, because that's where we're going to pick up 13. It says, Even so, ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. I'll tell you something, that girl was not edifying anybody. Amen. Not edifying anybody, telling them that it's all about a new house or a new car. That's not, that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Wherefore, he goes, all right, Zelsi says, Wherefore, because of this, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. There was no interpretation going on. There was no interpretation going on. Now, what's interesting is, is here he is saying that the one who is speaking in a language that people in the audience do not understand, he is the one who should be interpreting. Isn't that interesting? Because I have yet to see that. Uh, now, save one video. Let me say one video. One man that I've seen as a pastor, he, he did that interpret. But, man, of the hundreds I've seen of pastors who would speak garbage and never say a word about it, that blows my mind. In other words, they were completely unscriptural. And I don't, let the, I don't think the other one was very scriptural either. But, he goes on. What I'm saying is, is he says, that he, that is the one speaking, may interpret in other words, it's not going to do any good if you're not telling people what you mean. For if I pray, then he goes on to pray. Now here's what's interesting. Here is what he's saying. That, that he's about to talk about prayer and praise. Prayer and singing. Prayer and, and, and praise. And what the correct path is that we should seek. Okay? He says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. He said, if I, if I am in a spiritual, if you would, I, I feel like I'm close to God, or I'm feeling moved by God, but I don't know why or what, or what I'm feeling, what do I get from it? It's unfruitful. Now get that. It's unfruitful. It bears no fruit. We're to be bearing fruit. We're to be doing something. He said it's unfruitful. Understanding is unfruitful. Now, that, that is not to say that there are not times where we are moved of God, but we don't know what He wants, we don't know what He... And we pray and we say, God, you know, whatever Your will is, what, what You want, what Holy Spirit, make it known unto us what You want. In other words, we're seeking an understanding from the Lord. That's right. That's scriptural. Romans 8, 26. 26, it says, In the same way the Spirit helps our weaknesses, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through word, wordless groanings, or the, that moving of the Holy Spirit. Say, God, I don't know what we want. Lord, you just have your way. And the Holy Spirit knows what we need. The Holy Spirit knows how to make intercession for us. That's true. However, he goes, he's saying here, he says, there's nothing gained when we do not understand what we are communicating. There's nothing gained when we do not understand what we're communicating. Or, there's nothing gained when God is communicating to us. We don't know it. We don't know it. We don't know what it is. If there's no understanding, there's no benefit. These things are stated specifically because the Corinthian church had been doing these things. Now, what's Paul's response? Now, here's the response. This is what Paul is going to say. He's saying, this is what is going on. He says, it's unfruitful. What is it then? Verse 15. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. Now, very important to understand here. This is not an or, or an instead of. That's not in the text. It's not... He's not saying, I will pray with the Spirit or I will pray with understanding also. Or I will pray with the Spirit and instead of with the understanding also. It's not what he said. And that's where some interpret this verse. And that's not correct. That's not in the, in the wording at all. That's not the case. It's not an or or instead of. It's an and. Or an also. He said, I will have both of these things. Now, that's important, right? That's important. In other words, if I'm praying in the Spirit, if you would, but without any understanding, he's saying, I'm fruitful. Or if I'm praying, and I understand, but I've got no connection with God, it's just me saying words, it's unfruitful. 
And Paul is saying that I will do with both of these what God has asked me to do. I will sincerely seek God with my heart. I will sincerely seek His face and I will know exactly why I'm seeking His face. And, and, and every time that we have prayer, just in their deacons meeting, and Brick closes us out, and I'm listening to his prayer, and I'm in agreement with his prayer, I'm saying, yes, Lord, we need this. I'm in agreement with this. Now, we're going to get to that. Paul is going to make that point, that we have to be able to agree one with another. That is very scriptural. But we cannot agree with one another if we do not know what each other are saying. Now, that's, that's outside of what we're at right now. We're going to get there. Because right now, Paul is speaking of the individual. Right? He's speaking of the individual, the one praying. He said, you've got to know. You've got to be connected with the Lord and understand what's being prayed. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with understanding also. So again, <clears throat> we, we, we fall into this a little bit. It's a little bit easier to grab when dealing with the idea of worship, isn't it? Because we, we, we sometimes will just be singing and we're not paying attention to the words. Amen. Going through the motions. And, and that's wrong. That's wrong. We are to sing with the understanding also. But, but then we, we could also be caught up in it. And, and I've gone to concerts and things, and they're trying to drum up. And I make sure and I always tell the kids that I would go with, and, uh, which we haven't really been to many concerts here. I don't Anyway, but I tell them, I say, look, when they start saying this is church, just write that off. This is not it. And when they start saying that, you know, we're to be, that's, this is a concert. I make that clear. This is a concert. We have a good time in a concert, but uh, this is not worship service. All right. Now, and the reason is, typically, is because if you've ever been to a concert, you can't understand what is really being said. I mean, it, it, they're so loud, and there's a lot of noise, and you're not, you know, and it's, you know, hyped and pumped, but I'm like, I really don't know what they're saying. They could be saying something I disagree with, and I want to be careful about that. I have a good time and, and say, well, this was a fun event, but it's not a worship service. Okay, that's, there's a difference. There's a difference. Um, I, we heard Lauren Vega at AYC. Remember that? And someone said, man, she is talented. And I was like, yeah, she is talented. What do you think about that, Brother John? I remember saying this. I remember going, I don't know what I think about it because I could not understand what she was saying in the concert. It was a concert. It was fun. And then when I got her lyrics, I go, man, that's good. But in the moment, I was like, I don't know what to tell you because I'm not sure. And we, they could, they, all the kids could go down there and jump around if they wanted to jump around. But it's not worth it. It's a concert. So I don't know what she's saying. She may be saying something completely unscriptural. Right? So it needs to be a connection of both. I'm getting old. <laughs> Man. Uh, I enjoy, I am thoroughly enjoy a worship service where the Lord is moving and we know what's going on. Amen? That's a true... That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying it needs to be both. He's, notice what he said, though. I, wanted, I don't want to understate this. I will sing. I will sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with understanding. He is determined, isn't he? We should be determined as well. That's right. We should be determined as well to do this. In, in, in all facets of our worship and... Now think about this. When I, when I read this, I think about the Psalms immediately. Because you think the Jews and their heavenly songbook was not theologically deep? We don't sing some of those songs because we don't understand them because we have to sit down and study them and figure out what they're saying. And praise God to those that sing the Psalms because they are powerful. They're powerful. The, the Jew, the Jew, and many cultures who do still sing the book of Psalms to each other, those are powerful. Praise God for that. Praise God for that because they should do it in spirit and in understanding. Powerful verse there. Uh, else, go on verse 16, else, when thou shalt bless with the spirit, here's what I was talking about, when thou shalt bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say, Amen? At thy giving of thanks, seeing he understands not 
what thou sayest. And he's saying he, he's unlearned in that he's in the room with unlearned because he doesn't know the language that you're speaking. Not because it's some kind of ecstatic language like we just saw that no one could understand in the first place. But he's saying if, if you're speaking a language that, that, that people just don't know, they cannot agree. Now get this. Now what Paul is saying is that uh, he's saying it's a given. Isn't that interesting? It's a given. When you and I don't understand what is being said, that we do not all of a sudden jump in and go, yes! In other words, we hold back because we want to be careful about what we're agreeing with. We go, oh, I have no idea what he said or she said. I'm not going to just jump in there and agree. He says, given, you, won't, you should do that. You shouldn't do that. But I'm afraid that's what happens so often. He's, the only He's not saying amen at the end of things, since he does not understand what you said. That's when we open it up to those outside of the person itself. Now, are we supposed to be able to come together in agreement? 100%. Amen. That's what Jesus taught in Matthew 18, verse 19. He says, Again I say unto you, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, and it shall be done to them of my Father which is in heaven. Right? That's something that's quoted all the time, used all the time. But what he's saying in here is very important. He's saying that they understand what is being asked. They are in agreement. They know what each other is going at. Now, this is not, again, we're not doing a sermon, a service, or even a look on how to pray and God answer our prayers, right? Because hopefully we understand that when we seek God, we're to do it according to His will, right? We ask according to His will. Amen? We can expect God to move on that. And that's what the Bible teaches, clearly. He goes on. Looking at verse 17, he says, For thou verily or truly givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. He's not learned anything. He doesn't know. Isn't that interesting? He said, If a person is speaking a language the others do not understand, and if he's praying or just speaking it or singing in it, no one's edified. No one has grown in it. No one, no one has more confidence in the Lord. No one knows what is being, how God is being glorified. No one, no one understands. What exactly you're saying? And therefore, remember at the beginning of this is, is edification is the key. Edification is the key. The growing of, of knowledge is important. And, or the, the trust in the Lord. Or understanding what God is doing. And if that's not happening, Paul's saying, this is, this is not it. We've missed it. It really goes back to what I mentioned before. It's self-exaltation and not God exaltation. Right? And what we do here, we would exalt the Lord. He says, Paul says, according to what we're talking about, he says, I think, my God, I speak with tongues more than y'all. Now, we're not talking about, I oh, know, he's saying languages. He's saying, hey, I, he, he knows other words. Remember, he said, I, I'm, if I'm going to speak in a language, I'm going to know what I'm saying. And he's clear about this. So he's saying, these languages I speak, I know. They're not unknown to me. He wouldn't do that. Paul wouldn't do that. I think, my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue or language. Paul doesn't refer to what uh, he knew is uh, something unknown and understood. I, I mentioned that. Paul condemns the practice in full. He says, what I speak will be understood. That's what he's saying. I, what I speak in the church, around the bar, it will be understood. Even if it isn't much, it must be understood. Why? Ultimately, for the betterment of others. Anything else is self-exaltation. And that is not why we come together. Now notice, brethren, be not children in understanding. You see this? You see how he is sliding into a subject matter that he's addressed with the Corinthian church already. He's already addressed this. So in other words, he's saying that what you've been doing is something you don't understand. Your, your children and your understanding. This is incorrect 
theology. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice you can be children, be children. But in understanding, be men. Simply saying, he's saying, be mature children of God. It's not a show, it's not a game, it's not something we play around at, it's something that's serious and we learn. Listen, I know, I know, because I've listened to the same pastor 23 or 4 years of my life. My dad. And, if, and, and then I heard him every day in my life, right? And I love my dad. But I've heard everything he could say just about. Now it may have changed. I've been out from the house for a long while. But the reality is, I still needed to hear it. And, and what's hard for the young people to get is, is how critical good doctrine and good sound teaching is until you finally get away from good sound teaching and you're challenged by false doctrine. And you know it's false. You know something's wrong here, but you don't know how or what to, how to put your finger on it. And then you call home. And you go, hey, I remember you preached on this. You know, what did you say again? And, and then all of a sudden it becomes extremely important. But it's important for us to hear it over and over again, it's important for us to grab hold of it because, listen, it's not in here for no reason. It's in here to be used and to discuss and to, to debate and talk over and think about and pray over and, and discuss it with our neighbors, especially those that I believe are in deception. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 through 5, he is, in verse 20, he's throwing it back. He's throwing it back all the way to chapter 3. So turn there. In chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, I'm going to read 20 again. He says, Brethren, be not children in understanding. So verse 1 of chapter 3 says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. There's many passages that deal with this that say the same thing. Hebrews is one of them. And... and and what I didn't write down that just is, is in my mind right now is the one that simply says, if you don't have the basics of the faith down, we cannot move into the deeper things. And, and he's right. Why would we discuss the deep things, even the mysteries of God, if we cannot grab hold of salvation at its core? That's why I say this is not a topic that I typically even discuss with an assembly or a Pentecostal. I will first address salvation and secure the believer, which is the basics. And we'll handle that. We'll talk about that till they either don't want more or, or it's not going anywhere or whatever. And then if they want to discuss this, we'll go there. He says, I, I talked to you as carnal, even as in the babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, not the meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. Hadn't changed any. Now look, they've been talking in tongues for a while now. Hadn't helped them one bit. They've got, not grown one out. He says, you were babes when I left. You babes when I come back. I have to address all of this. Now th that's a chastisement if I ever heard one. He says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying, now here's how he knows they're carnal, envying, strife, divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one says, I am of Paul, another says, I am of Paulus, he said, Are you not carnal? Who is Paul? Who is Paulus? The ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave them name. He said, They're nothing but men. It's about Jesus, the one who can save. It's about knowing Jesus. It's about knowing His security and His salvation and His grace and His mercy. He said, that's what it's about. And you've missed it because you started naming men off. He said, this is, this is ludicrous. When it's about men, it's not about God. If it's not about God, we're doing it wrong. So in verse 20, again, he says, How be it in malice be children. It, you know, y'all been envying fight. He said, if you want to be, he said, that, let's, put, let's put some stuff away. Let's be children in some areas. And, and you know, we think about that, and you know what he's talking about, right? Children forget things in a day or two. They forget why they're mad. They could, you know, when you're young, you punch each other in the face or you yell at each other, and the next day you're shooting basketball again, and, and everything's fine. But adults, we kind of hold on to it. 
and then we try to really get each other back in some kind of deception. He says, forget that. He said, get over the, your, your being upset, your envies and your strifes. Your, get, get rid of that. Forget those things. Move on. He said, but in your understanding, you need to be men. In your understanding of Scripture, be men. In the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they hear not uh, will they not hear me? I apologize for that. He says, In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they there again, and yet for all that will they not hear me, says the Lord. And of course this is a quote from Isaiah 28. That's all. It's a quote from Isaiah 28. And you read the whole context of Isaiah 28. The whole thing. Get, get the whole thing. Go and, and read it. Basically, he's saying that they rejected his word. They've rejected the scriptures. They've turned every man their own kind of ways. And God is going to send a people to bring them into captivity. And they'll be, speak, he said, they'll be speaking other languages then. And then you'll get it. Then you'll get it. You have not followed after God. This is, Isaiah 28, verse 11 says, Well then, very well then, with four lips. And this is from the uh, ESV. And I don't often do that. You know, never. But I want it to be very clear to you today. So can treat it as a commentary. Very well then, with four lips and strange tongues, God will speak to this people, to whom he said... This is the rest wherewith he may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now that's kind of the conclusion of what he was saying. He was saying, I came with rest, I came with all these blessings, you would not hear, and so a people will come in here, and they will captivate you, they'll take you captive, and they'll put you under bondage, and then you'll get it. You wouldn't hear the promises that I made you. In other words, when they were coming to speak in a language, it was to get their attention that they had not listened to God. And so, in other words, Paul is throwing back the Old Testament saying, what was the foundation of hearing a language unknown unto you? What was the foundation? He was saying, to get our attention that we were not following after God. So then, if that was how it was begun, that's how God introduced hearing a foreign language. How will God use a foreign language in the New Testament? And so he says it. He says, verse 22, Wherefore, tongues are a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Well, I wonder how many people over here that was assigned to. All those videos, uh, uh, you go and look at all of them. All of you pull up the thousand plus videos on YouTube and look at them and listen to them, take time. How many people are lost in those videos hearing the gospel and being saved? Let me tell you how many. I haven't found one. I haven't found one. In other words, they're all unscriptural. They're not following scripture. The tongues was not for the, the saved. It was a sign for the lost. That's how it originally was, and that's exactly what happened in Acts. They spoke other languages and dialects because people had come in from different areas, and they heard the gospel that Jesus the Messiah had come, and they needed to repent. They needed to repent. That's what Isaiah was saying. You, you should have followed me, God was saying, but you did not. You need to repent and believe the gospel. And they did. Thousands did. 3,000. Incredible, incredible day of salvation. Not everybody did, but thousands did. That was what the language was for originally. That's what God uh, was doing. <clears throat> uh, we read uh, verse 22. Right. Right. He says, Tongues are a sign not for them to believe, but for them to believe not. But prophesying, right? The foretelling of the future, the speaking of the new messages from God and the people. Are we keeping this in context of chapter 13, right? Prophecy will fail. It's going to end. Tongues will cease. 
He's saying that while they're here, what is, what is the purpose? This is the purpose. To be telling what will happen and to be telling the message of God to the people. This is the message of God to the people. He says, Prophecy serveth not to them that believe not, but for them which believe. So when we come here, guess what we're going to be doing? We're going to be looking at the words of God. We're going to be reading the words of God. We're going to be studying the words of God. We're going to see what God has planned in the future. We're going to see what God has for us now. We're going to be looking at His standard for us in life. That's what we're going to be doing. That's what we'll be doing. We can end with verse 23. If therefore the whole church can come, be come together into one place and all speak with languages, tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned. They don't know that language. Or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? This goes back to what you're saying. He's saying if one's speaking one language and another speaking another language, they look at each other, not understand one another, say they're barbarians. In other words, they're saying, I have no idea. They're a foreigner to me. And so if one comes in and they don't understand what's being said, they'll say, these people are foreign to me. And they'll leave the place. So it did them nothing. And Paul will say what's better in the next verse, right? So I just wanted to share a little bit of that. Share those little videos. The frustration that is there. It's not, I don't lose sleep over this, right? It's not something we should lose sleep over. But it's something that should be discussed and gone over thought through and examined by scripture examined by scripture and understand what's going on uh, it is when the push for emotion trumps that of truth we're in the wrong place Amen. but likewise if we hold to nothing but truth but we're never moved by God we're also in the wrong place they have to come together it's the same as, as, as we've, I've talked about many times. Spirit and truth work together. Spirit and truth work together. There needs to be a perfect meeting. Let's go over it. Well, John, yeah. you what we discussed in, uh, Oh, man, what part? Which one? About the, uh, oh, the love offering. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I forgot about that. So, um, it's uh, Lorna Heffley's daughter, the, the, the granddaughter, or is it? Huh? Granddaughter, right, right. Who has, has cancer and their treatments, and uh, that, of course, that's going to be costly, uh, be around a year long plus, but it's a good, it's a good diagnosis for what it is. And um, so, but we talked about doing a love offering, and that will be two Sundays. So we'll announce it next Sunday, and then the following we'll have a love offering, the 26th. So um, let's be talking about that. Let's be bringing that up and mentioning that and prepare for that because, uh, you know, they were from here, they, they, uh, uh, their family, and so let's support them and, and pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for that, that granddaughter. Also mentioned if we didn't take up the vows, the church would uh, make up the difference the number of Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, so if for some reason we don't get 1,000, we're going to get the church... Uh, we'll bring it up to a thousand, but if um, if not, um, but it's it you know people will support that, especially if we talk about it. People will support that family. Uh, I'm all for that, but our mission Sunday right. is also No, that's next month. That's next month. Oh, you're talking about. She's talking about. Yeah, yeah, he's talking about this month. <laughs> right. Thank you, Mr. You, you got it. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> Mission's committee. All uh, right. Yeah. No, that's right. This is going to be separate. So this will be this month, uh, two Sundays from now. And we do have mission, uh, World's Missions a month. Uh, listen, we'll have um, Brother Danny Ballard here uh, the last Sunday of February. That's when I could get him. That was his open Sunday. Uh, he'll be here to present and talk about missions in the Philippines. We have several missionaries in the Philippines, but he's on furlough right now. He can be here. And then Brother Don, John, Dr. John David Smith, who is our national coordinator of our world's missions uh, for the BMA, he'll be here, but he couldn't be here in February. He could only be here the first Sunday in March. And so he'll be here in March. But y'all uh, being prayer about that, That's uh, that was uh, uh, just something that we kind of started calling around and got what we could get. And uh, so be in prayer for that. Looking forward to having both of them 
and uh, that will be thinking about that World Missions Month. Okay. All right. Let's be in, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your blessing. Thank you for your watch and care over us. Lord, lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Father, I pray that what we do is uh, pleasing and honoring to you. Father, that you would lead us in that truth and guide us by your Holy Spirit. Father, that we may do that which is pleasing in your sight. And we may be close to you as well. Father, if we're not close to you, then we're in error. Draw us near you in your presence. Lord, I pray that you guide us at Bethel number one. Lead us to do your will, especially as uh, we are entering this year. Uh, Lord, so much going on already. Uh, it's going to be an amazing year, Lord, and uh, I pray that many, many, many hundreds of souls are saved. Yes. And Father, I, I know that you have your hand in all of it, and you're doing a work in all of it. And Father, we thank you for being so, so apparent, so obvious in what you're trying to do. And Lord, lead us to, to follow you in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.